Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our next mini lesson in English 12b. Today we're going to be discussing the Victorians and the Victorian era of English literature. A time of eight, about 1832 to 1901 where a lot of change was going on. Be sure to take your Cornell notes, and if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to your instructors. Let's get underway. During Queen Victoria's reign, England went from horse-drawn carriages to motor cars, from rules by aristocrats to votes for every man, from a land of farmers to a land of factories. England also actively embraced imperialism as the country's destiny and duty to the world. As their country changed in unexpected ways, the English moved from happy confidence and progress to increasing doubt. Some writers turned away from the new reality and others tackled it head on. The phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire, was boasted by the Victorians, and it was true. With holdings around the globe from Africa to India, Ireland to New Zealand, and Hong Kong to Canada, it was always daytime in some part of the vast territory ruled by Britain. More than just a simple fact, however, this phrase captured the attitude of an era. During the reign of Queen Victoria, England was a nation in motion. This is a world of action, and not for moping and droning in, said Victorian novelist Charles Dickens, and his contemporaries seemed to agree. During this period, England was at the height of its power, both politically and economically. Abroad, Britain dominated world politics, and at home, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. With new factories turning out goods of every kind at an unprecedented pace, England became known as the workshop of the world. For those with wealth and influence, including the burgeoning middle class, it was an expansive time, a time of energy and vitality, a time of rapid and dramatic change. Yet, large segments of the population suffered greatly during this period. Many writers decried the injustice, rapid pace, and materialism of the age, including poet Matthew Arnold, who referred to the strange disease of modern life, with its sick hurry, its divided aims. This period of change is named after the person who, more than any other, stood for the age. Queen Victoria, just 18 years old when she was crowned in 1837, went on to rule for 63 years, seven months, and two days, the longest reign in English history. Victorians enjoyed Victoria's devotion to hard work and duty, her insistence on proper behavior, and her unapologetic support of British imperialism became hallmarks of the Victorian period because of her dedication to those ideals. Victoria was well aware of how previous monarchs had clashed with Parliament and made themselves unpopular with their arrogant, inflexible attitudes. She realized that the role of royalty had to change. Pragmatically accepting the idea of a constitutional monarchy in which she gave advice rather than orders, Victoria yielded control of day-to-day -day governmental affairs to a series of very talented prime ministers, Lord Melbourne, Sir Robert Peel, Lord Palmerston, and the rival politicians Benjamin Disraeli and William E. Gladstone. The, positive, the position of prime minister assumed even greater importance. It became more important even after the death of Victoria's beloved husband, Prince Albert, in 1861, where she withdrew herself from politics and spent the rest of her life in mourning. The Industrial Revolution had already transformed England into a modern industrial state by the time Victoria took the throne. By 1850, England boasted 18,000 cotton mills and produced half of the iron in the world. The Industrial Revolution created vast new wealth for England's rapidly growing middle class. This material progress was celebrated in the Great Exhibition of 1851, the purpose of which was to, to display the works of industry of all nations. Housed in an enormous glittering glass and steel building called the Crystal Palace, the exhibition showcased every marvel of the age. Indoor toilets, telegraphs, power looms, electric lights, even a full-sized locomotive. 17,000 exhibits in all. 
for the middle class who ran factories, all these inventions represented both a means of making money and a dazzling array of goods to spend it on. Middle class Victorians enjoyed indulging themselves in displays of wealth, from top hats and ruffled dresses to large houses crammed with heavy ornate furniture and fancy knickknacks. With the help of servants, hostesses vied to serve the most lavish fish. Excuse me. With the help of servants, hostesses vied to serve the most lavish feasts and, insecure in their new respectability, tried to outdo each other in displays, refining, manners, and behavior. Some writers, such as Thomas Babington Macaulay, expressed enthusiasm for the material advantages afforded by the Industrial Age. Others, such as Thomas Carlyle and William Morris, were appalled by Victorian materialism, which they saw as tasteless, joyless, and destructive of community. Likewise, the virtuous heirs adopted by the middle class who often had trouble living up to their own uncompromising moral standards, led to angry charges of hypocrisy. While the middle class was becoming more prosperous, conditions for the poor grew more intolerable. Factory workers spent 16-hour days toiling for low wages under harsh and dangerous conditions. Children especially suffered. Five-year-olds worked in the cotton mills as scavengers, crawling under the moving machinery to pick up bits of cotton from the floor or in the coal mines dragging heavy tubs of coal through narrow tunnels. Pay just a few cents a day, child workers endured empty bellies, frequent beatings, and air so filled with dust that they could hardly breathe. To make matters worse, in the 1840s, unemployment in England soared, leaving many families without a breadwinner. In addition, the potato blight and famine that devastated Ireland in 1845 forced two million starvation, excuse me, forced two million starving people to immigrate. Many crowded into England's already squalid slums. Though Parliament enacted many important reforms during this period, changes came slowly as the middle and upper classes came to realize that the poor were not to blame for their own plight. In 1833, Parliament abolished slavery in the British Empire and passed the first laws restrict restricting child labor. It also ushered in free trade, repealing laws that kept out cheaper foreign grain. Slowly, more reforms followed. Gladstone and the new Liberal Party established public schools and mandated secret ballots for elections. Gladstone's rival, the Tory politician Di Sorelli, won passage of bills that improved housing and sanitation, legalized trade unions, eased harsh factory conditions, and in 1867 gave the vote to working class men. Even for those who benefited most, though, progress could be painful. Despite their admiration for technology and their faith in human ingenuity, most Victorians were deeply religious, and some of the theories proposed by modern scientists threatened to cherish beliefs. In 1830, the geologist Charles Lyell published evidence that the Earth was formed not in 4004 BC, as held by popular interpretations of the Bible, but millions of years earlier. Then in 1859, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species introduced his theory that plant and animal species evolved through natural selection, an idea that prompted furious debate because it seemed to contradict the biblical amount of creation. There is not a creed which is not shaken, wrote poet and critic Matthew Arnold, not an accredited dogma where it's not shown to be questionable, not a received tradition which doesn't threaten to dissolve. Though DiCirelli and Gladstone worked in tandem for domestic reform, they bitterly opposed each other on the issues of British imperialism. Throughout Victoria's rule, the British Empire had been steadily expanding, starting with the annexation of New Zealand in 1840 and the acquisition of Hong Kong two years later. In 1858, after a rebellion of, in India by native troops called Sepoys, Parliament took administrative control of the colony away from the British East Indi India Company, put the colony under the direct administration of the British government. Gladstone was one was a little Englander, one who opposed further expansion. De Sorelli, in contrast, saw imperialism as the key to Britain's prosperity and patriotic destiny. Victoria sided with De Sorelli, in part because his flamboyant charm appealed to her, while she loathed the staid, self-righteous Gladstone, and she allowed him to pursue his ambitions. He bought England a large share in Egypt's newly completed Suez Canal, acquired the Mediterranean island of Cyprus, and annexed the Transvaal, a Dutch settlement in South Africa. De Sorelli even persuaded the Queen to accept the title, 
Empress of India. Fascinated by the exploits of their explorers, missionaries, and empire builders in Africa and Asia, most British citizens, including certain writers, supported imperialism. Rudyard Kipling, for example, wrote short stories and poems glorifying the expansion of the British Empire. Indeed, it was Kipling who conveyed the idea that it was England's burden or duty to bring civilization to the rest of the world. William Morris contradicted him, asking, what is England's place? To carry civilization through the world? Civilization cannot be worth much when it is necessary to kill a man in order to make him accept it. As the years passed and colonial conflicts increased, British citizens began to agree with Mort and supported for, support for imperialism waned. By the 1830s, Romanticism was certainly past its height. Shelley, Keats, and Byron were dead, and Wordsworth was no longer a youthful revolutionary, but a stuffy, elderly member of the establishment. Still, young up-and-coming poets such as Robert Browning and Alfred Lord Tennyson had been raised on the Romantics. Of course, they had their likes and dislikes. Tennyson said that Wordsworth, at his best, was on the whole the greatest English poet since Milton. Well, Browning, who idolized Byron and Shelley, told fellow poet and future wife Elizabeth Barrett that he would travel to a distant city just to see a block of Byron's hair, but could not get up any enthusiasm enough to cross the room if it were the other end of it all, Wordsworth. Coleridge and Southey were condensed into that little china bottle yonder. Overall, though, the Romantic movement had enormous influence on early Victorian poets, not so much on their style of writing, which was often brilliantly original, but on their ideas of what poetry should be. On the streets they saw factories belching smoke and ragged, hungry children begging pennies. In their writing, though, they ignored this grim reality, focusing instead on more poetic subjects, ancient legends, exotic foreign lands, romantic love, and the awe-inspiring beauty of nature. Matthew Arnold argued that the poet could have no higher goal than to delight himself with the contemplation of some noble action of a heroic time and to enable others, through his representation of it, to delight in it also. Perhaps this approach was pure escapism, perhaps optimism, or perhaps just as attitudes inherited from an earlier generation hindered social reform, literary ideals inherited from the Romantics kept the first Victorian poets from redefining poetry for their own time. Looking at the range and quality of Victorian novelists, the humor, pathos, and unforgettable characters of Charles Dickens, the psychological depth of George Eliot, and the dark passion of Emily Bronte and her sister Charlotte Bronte, it's hard to believe that at the time they wrote, fiction was widely considered to be simply light entertainment, not serious literature. To be fair, the vast majority of novels published weren't great books like David Copperfield and Middlemarch, the same mass production that filled Victorian homes with inexpensive bric-a-brac of doubtful taste also poured out cheap thrillers and maudlin, weepy tales known as penny dreadfuls and shilling shockers, which the working class in particular devoured. Middle class readers enjoyed a good cry, too, but they wanted more. They wanted to meet characters like themselves and the people they knew. They wanted to learn more about the rapidly changing world. In other words, they wanted realism. Realistic novels tried to capture everyday life as if it was really lived. Rather than ignoring science and industry as Romanticism did, realism focused on the effects of the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain. Keen-eyed and sharp-witted, realistic writers probed every corner of their society from the drawing room to the slum, exposing problems and pretensions. Some openly crusaded for reform, others were more restrained considering their role to be, as George Eliot put it, the rousing of no the nobler emotions which make mankind desire the social right, not the prescribing of special measures. Victorians' love of reading was no by limited to fiction. The same periodicals that provided them was the most recent novel installment by Trollope, Thackeray, or Dickens also offered articles and essays on every imaginable subject, from Arctic exploration to pin making, as one scholar put it. Victorians were generalists, curious about all aspects of their changing world, and they read for pleasure the sort of nonfiction that today might only appeal to specialists in a particular academic field. So it was a mix of romanticism, realism, and Victorian ideals. That's it for our mini lesson today. If you have any questions, be sure to reach out to your instructors for assistance. Make sure you submit those Cornell notes, and we'll see you back here next time.